for grants. Many of you know Anne as a longtime director of arts education, <clears throat> has stepped into the role of associate director for grants. Krishna Adams, director of visual arts, craft, media, and design. Shannon Ford, our director of community arts. Bradley Mason, our folk life director. Kim Johnson, director of arts excess. And Evangeline Mee, our traditional arts specialist. Uh, we're obviously sad that we can't join you in person. Normally, uh, this time of year, we are on the road for uh, several weeks uh, doing, you know, a dozen or more workshops, in-person workshops throughout the state. But, you know, uh, as we're grateful that we have this technology available and uh, we're, you know, hoping to sort of give you as much of the same experience as possible. Um, virtually so uh you know here's here, here's to know here, here here goes nothing um all right so today's agenda is uh a, again sort of a standard grants workshop we're going to give you a brief overview of what we do here at the tennessee arts commission we're going to talk a lot about uh some of our grant opportunities we're going to show you the basics on how to apply for our grants, basics of how to manage the grants. We're going to give you some helpful hints and tips. And uh, like all of our workshops, you know, we're going to entertain and answer questions. Uh, so the way we're going to try to handle this through the WebEx is via the chat function. So uh, those of you who have a question, can use the chat to uh, either send the question to the group at large. You can just send it to everyone if you want to, or if you'd like your question to uh, remain private, then please send it to Lee Baird, who is going to be uh, moderating those questions. Lee uh, or any of the program staff, frankly, who are monitoring the chat can either address your question via the chat or um, we'll save it and um, Lee or myself or one of the other program directors will address it to the group at large. So, uh, like all workshops, we always begin with our mission statement, which is the mission of the Tennessee Arts Commission is to cultivate the arts for the benefit of all Tennesseans and their communities. We do that primarily through grant making. Uh, last fiscal year, fiscal year 20, we made 954 total grants for $6.4 million in all 95 counties. Now our grants were for nonprofits and local governments, to schools, student ticket subsidies. These are programs you're gonna hear about in uh, greater detail a little bit later in the program. We pride ourselves on uh, efficient online grants management. Uh, some of you who have been around for a while can remember a time before we uh, handled all of this online. So uh, we're thankful that we have some tools to, to expedite the process and make things easier on both you all and uh, us as an agency. Uh, last fiscal year, we impacted over 8.5 million adults in Tennessee and 2.8 million children and youth. All of this was in service to uh, Tennessee's uh, arts industry, which has a tremendous uh, economic impact, as you can see from this slide. The results from a, re a recent survey showed us that in Tennessee, we generated over a billion dollars in annual economic activity, supported nearly 40,000 jobs, and brought in state revenues of over $135 million. So it's important work here, and we're, we're Happy to be able to do it and thankful to you all for, for helping carry out the mission to, uh, to service the arts here in Tennessee. I wanted to talk just very briefly about how we are funded. So we are funded in three buckets. Uh, first of all, we do receive an appropriation from the state legislature. That money uh, is used for many different purposes. Uh, it also uh, is used, you know, to to help pay for our salaries and help to pay for our office needs and for that efficient and effective grants management systems, things like that. Some of that money is also uh, granted back out into the community, of course. 
We also receive an annual grant from the National Endowment for the Arts and some other various federal funding that's used uh, to carry out arts programming around the state. Also helps us with some of our um, staff needs as well. And by far the uh, largest uh, funding area for us is our specialty license plate program. Uh, many of you are familiar with this, uh, but for those of you who might not be familiar with this, the Arts Commission receives a share of nearly every specialty license plate sold in the state of Tennessee. We're not just talking about the uh, arts plates, but we're talking about any of the non Tennessee standard plates. Uh, we have a uh, an, uh, a statute in the legislature that uh, allows the Arts Commission to share in the funding of those uh, plates. So we lean on our arts organizations heavily to help us promote this program. It's a very successful program. Uh, in the last year, it brought in over $5.5 million to the Tennessee Arts Commission, uh, every dollar of which is regranted out back into communities uh, around Tennessee and and um, so the more successful this program is, the more uh, money we have to uh, to grant out to arts organizations and artists around the state. So wanted to make sure, of course, that we highlight that. All right. So without further ado, and I'll just mention, uh, I mentioned that many of my colleagues are on the, the webinar as well. I, I've done this probably 50 times, uh, but I always leave out important information and often misspeak. So I invite any of my colleagues to interrupt me at any time to for a correction or an addition. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to be talking about uh, grants today. And the first sort of grouping I'd like to talk about are our annual grants. Now, these are grants that have once a year fixed application deadlines. Most of these grants have deadlines in January and uh, their applications are usually available in October. In fact, applications for these grants are open now uh, as of yesterday. In fact, and I'm going to be showing you a little bit uh, about how you can access these applications. Um, they're also broken down into categories based on the type of funding they provide. Uh, some of the grants are, they provide funds for singular arts projects that an organization might be carrying out during the course of the year. And some of the categories provide uh, funds that can be used for an organization's general operating expenses. Uh, well, before we drill down uh, too specifically on these grants, I should let you know that most of our grant opportunities are available for 501c3 nonprofit organizations, both those that identify as arts organizations, that is like 51% or more of their activities are focused directly on the arts, or 501c3 non-arts organizations that have less, less of a percentage focused on arts. We also make grants uh, to entities of governments like towns or parks and have some funding opportunities available for individuals. We also have a large portfolio of uh, grants that cover uh, opportunities for arts education. Uh, we're gonna be talking about those more specifically a little bit later in the presentation as well. Okay, so now is where I try and drive this WebEx. So I'm going to be toggling back and forth between uh, this very sort of basic uh, PowerPoint presentation and uh, a web browser so I can show you all this content. I might be leaning left and right because I have three monitors in front of me. But as we're talking about our grants, I just wanted to show you our website here. Uh, tnartscommission.org, where you can find all of the details I'll be talking about. I'm going to show you how to access them. So we're going to be talking about grants. So I'm going to pull down our menu here. 
and here's our large category grants. And first of all, we're going to be talking about our grant opportunities, as I mentioned. So here I will show you that we have all of our grant opportunities listed here. And we have this cool little filtering system that you can use if you are sort of overwhelmed with the, the number of choices and wanted to drill down a little further. You can filter grants that are currently open or closed, uh, grants for individuals, grants for organizations, and then, as I mentioned, the two big categories we're talking about here are project grants and operating support grants. So the first grant program that we usually talk about and I'll talk about today is our arts project support category here. It's one of our most popular categories. It's one that allows organizations to apply for funds to carry out an arts project in their community. Things like plays or musicals, fairs, festivals, conferences, uh, confer concerts, um, all sorts of things. So this grant, um, like a lot of our grants, is a matching grant which means that for every dollar you apply for, you have to match it with $1 of your own money. There are a few outliers to this rule, and you can find out which ones uh, don't adhere exactly to that rule by drilling down into the full guidelines of these grants, which are available on this page. So you remember I just clicked from the grants, uh, grants at a glance page directly into our arts project support, and that pulls up the full guidelines, which can be accessed here by expanding these categories. So this is everything you need to know about the grant, including um, your eligibility requirement, what, what types of organizations are eligible to receive these funds. We even have uh, some helpful information that some of you uh, long term, long time grantees might not be familiar with, we actually have the evaluation criteria listed right here. So you can familiarize yourself on what you're going to be critiqued on once you finally submit your application. A little bit higher up in the page here, we have the basics of the grants. So this grant, I mentioned that most of our annual deadline grants have application deadlines in January. So what happens is you have your application open now. You need to have that application completed and submitted by January. This grant, as you see, is due on January 19th, 20, well, 2022. That's a, a misprint. Obviously that should be 2021. I don't want to go too far ahead of ourselves, so we'll make that correction. Sorry about that. But what you're doing is you are applying for funds with the deadline in January for projects you're proposing to do during the subsequent fiscal year. So applications due in January are for projects that take place beginning July 1st and it will need to be completed by June 15th. So I'm sorry to have this confusing wrong uh, dates and deadlines. This is obviously a, a, a find and replace error, but uh, you can see right here, this is correct, that the projects you'll be applying for deadlines in January are for projects that occur from July 1st, 2021 to June 15th, 2022. You can see Basically, who's eligible here? 501c3 nonprofit organizations legally chartered and headquartered in Tennessee and entities of local government, as I mentioned. And you can find out how much money you can request from us. $500 to $9,000. Arts organizations serving a statewide audience can apply for up to $10,000. Now, many of you uh, have projects that maybe go beyond the bounds of your immediate community. Um, but just not to confuse you, these statewide organizations, um, are, they're very specific in nature. And uh, if you have any questions on, on whether you could qualify for this, you can give us a call. But, but um, for most of you, you will, will have a funding maximum in the arts project support category for $9,000. Uh, this category has a sister program that functions exactly the same, but it's for rural counties. So 
arts project support and rural arts project support are basically the exact same grants program, but which one you apply for depends on the county in which your organization is incorporated. So you see here on arts project support, we have our counties listed for the urban county. So if your organization is, is incorporated in one of these counties and you wanna apply for this particular kind of grant, you would apply through this program. I'm just gonna back out really quickly and show you the rural arts project support grant category. And if your county is located in one of these, or your organization rather is located in one of these counties, you would apply for a rural arts project support category grant. Um, <clears throat> so again, we have all of the, the basics here about when the projects need to occur, de deadlines, eligibility requirements, and again, the full evaluation criteria descriptions and eligibility requirements listed down here. I, I point that out because um, it's important for you all to sort of familiarize yourselves with all the details before you begin the, uh, the down the road of actually making a grant application. Some of the applications are a little bit lengthy and I don't want people to sort of go down the wrong path. We'll talk a little bit more about applying for a grant and, and some things that are, are good to do before you go down that path a little bit later in the presentation. So I've done a lot of talking now and I, I kind of wanted to pass it over to one of my colleagues. I'm gonna pass it over first to my colleague, Shannon Ford, who's the Director of Community Arts, who is gonna speak uh, about a couple of other grant programs that he manages, uh, specifically our Creative Placemaking Program and our Arts Build Community Program. Shannon? Good morning, everybody. It's great to see so many uh, friendly and uh, attentive faces. Um, I am, uh, as Jared mentioned, the Director of Community Arts Development for the Tennessee Arts Commission. And the first program I'm going to talk about is the Creative Placemaking Program. And this uh, program is designed to help uh, communities enhance the distinctive local character of Tennessee places for positive economic and community outcomes through arts and culture. Um, and this program really does focus on collaborations that give community members and artists um, agency in their communities, uh, arts programming, planning, and development. And um, really uh, the, the, the outcomes that the program focuses on is how um, the arts are, you know, improving um, the offerings in the community for to Im positively impact re local residents' lives. So um, it activates space, but it's really also supposed to, you know, um, tie into um, the aspirations and desires of the community for um, the arts. Um, one thing that I, I should mention about this program is that, as Jared said, we have some outliers in terms of how um, different programs operate. This one is one of those ones where um, matching is a little different from our one-to-one -one match um, in our other programs. So for this uh, program, um, applicants can request um, $4 of grant dollars for every $1 of match, um, four to one. Um, and then also um, in terms of the match, um, the uh, any applicant can um, use in kind as match, um, either part for a partial match or for a full match. This is different from all of our other grant programs um, where we do not allow in kind to be used uh, in the place of a cash match. Um, further, um, this program, um, since it does focus on um, places and design um, and revitalization, this, this program does allow for um, applicants to request um, 
capital expenses. Um, so that that is a difference from uh, our other programs. And then uh, also I should point out that yes, this does have a January deadline um, and um, there is a maximum request of $10,000 for projects that are uh, ta targeting just one community and a maximum request of 15,000 for more regionally based projects. Um, and this uh, this program um, is uh, one that we've had going for about um, five years. So um, Jared, if you don't mind um, taking people to the directory, um, you can see this over on the side of the guidelines. And we do have examples um, from past years um, that are a part of this directory, our creative placemaking directory. And just like our guidelines, you can see that over on the right hand side, there are filters so that you can really look at um, projects that might um, be something that is similar to what you want to achieve in your community. Or you may want to see what's been funded in Middle Tennessee or what's been funded in, in uh, West Tennessee, or if there's a particular um, type of uh, arts programming that you're, you're really focusing on, you can filter by the artistic discipline. Um, I see a question um, about how is regional um, versus community defined? So um, that's a great question. And the, the short answer is that if your project's taking place in a, a one neighborhood or one um, area of town, um, that's gonna be um, really community uh, based. If you are really focusing on um, connecting different communities or different neighborhoods and, you know, uh, trying to make sure that there's uh, activation of space, not only in those areas, but between those areas, that's going to be more regional. So we do have, uh, we have had uh, a few successful um, uh, applications that are more regional. Um, and um, one of those uh, that was funded this last year was um, in the town of Tracy City. Um, and they um, were really trying to uh, connect a local park with a um, uh, trail that runs through their town and into other parts uh, other parts of the county. So that's an example of a more regionally based one. Um, and so uh, next question, uh, connecting one zip code to another suffice, uh, would suffice as regional? It could. Um, the devil's in the details, but it, it could. Um, so um, I'm going to, uh, so, uh, this this town of Tracy City um, uh, um, grant that uh, Jared is highlighting is actually a prior grant that they received. We will be updating um, the directory in the next week or two to include uh, the most recent fiscal year um, 2020 grants uh, that were uh, completed this past um, June. So just know that um, there's going to be more information on, in this directory very soon. Um, Jared, could we um, move back to the guidelines and then I will talk about um, the Arts Build Communities uh, program. So if we could go to the ABC guidelines. Now, um, the, the slide that had the annual grants before, we didn't include ABC on this um, because uh, Arts Build Communities is a program that is off our regular cycle of deadlines. So um, the deadline for this program is typically July 1st of every year. 
Um, this is a program that um, while we fund it, we don't uh, administer it directly. We have 13 partners across the state that we call designated agencies. Um, and Jared, if you don't mind scrolling down to the listing of the designated agencies in the guidelines. Um, and so we, we have um, organizations really applying to more local or regional organizations, our partners, um, for grants funding. Um, ABC is typically a, a program in which um, small emerging and volunteer driven organizations have their first request for funding to the Tennessee Arts Commission. Um, and the program is designed to provide support for arts projects that broaden access to arts experiences address community quality of life issues through the arts or enhance the sustainability of asset based cu cultural enterprises. There's a, um, five very broad based um, uh, um, uh, objectives that are a part of the program. And so um, we, we try to really cover the range of arts programming that could occur in your your community. Um, they do this pro this uh, grant opportunity is a matching opportunity. It is dollar for dollar matching. So for every dollar of grant um, funding that you're requesting, um, you will need to show at least another dollar that you're raising on your own. Um, and there is a maximum request of thirty five hundred dollars. Um, so um, let's see if there are other questions about the ABC program. Uh, it doesn't look like there are, um, but it does. Uh, I will go back to creative, creative placemaking very quickly. There's another question. Um, does the in-kind part have to be given during the grant period? Yes, it does. Um, it, so with any of our grants, um, the grant activities and expenses and donations do have to take place within the um, the grant period. So for creative placemaking, that's going to be between July 1st of 2021 and um, June 15th of 2022. Uh, we, we were at any one time. Uh, we are managing three different fiscal years. So sometimes I have to really think about that. Um, so that really wraps up the some of the programs I wanted to highlight. Um, Jared, if you're ready to take over, um, I'm ready to give it back to you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Shannon. That's very, very informative. I really appreciate that. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to another one of my esteemed colleagues, Ms. Kim Johnson, <laughs> who directs our arts access program to talk about uh, that particular grant program. Kim? Oh, thanks, Jared. And good morning to everyone. And uh, love that word esteem, Jared. Wow, I've never been called that. So this is, <laughs> this is a first. <laughs> uh, in terms of arts access, and Jared's going to pull that up for us, and uh, we can look at some of the guidelines around that also. Um, Jared has already covered a lot of the eligibility for arts access, but just a quick review on that is that um, these applications are for arts Arts access are now open, um, and our deadline for that is January the 19th in terms of receiving your application for arts access. Arts access is open to nonprofit um, organizations, both arts and non-arts organizations, as well as governmental um, entities. Uh, most folks will apply up to $9,000 um, for an arts access uh, grant, between $1,000 and $9,000. But what is arts access? A question that is um, asked a lot. And arts access is really all about reaching underserved and underrepresented populations throughout Tennessee. We want everyone to have equal access to the arts, no matter um, where they live, what their physical ability is, what their race is, uh, what their income level is, we want them to have um, access to the arts programming that goes on throughout Tennessee. 
And so with organizations who apply to arts access, that's what we're hoping to do. Right now, underserved, you may ask, what are underserved, underrepresented populations throughout Tennessee? And these may include these following groups, as you'll see in the guidelines. It includes different ethnic groups that could be Native American in particular, African American, Latino, and so on. You can see them in the guidelines. Uh, we're trying to reach people with disabilities. That includes all types of disabilities, intellectual, emotional, physical disabilities. Uh, we're trying to increase access to the arts for um, older adults people age 65 and, and older who may be isolated um, socially or live in a geographic location where they're not having access. We love it when organizations design projects um, that will reach um, those populations. And last but not least, also those who are reaching active duty um, veterans, uh, military personnel and their families. Uh, these are the types of projects that and, and populations that we're trying to reach in terms of underserved, underrepresented populations. Um, as uh, been mentioned before, as you can see through the guidelines, uh, there is a one-to-one -one match uh, in arts access. Another frequent question that I'll get around arts access, hey, if I apply for a um, arts project support grant, or if I apply for an ABC grant, or if I apply for multiple uh, major cult cultural institution grant, can I also apply for arts access? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, a lot of times people apply in other grant categories, but also apply in arts access because they're trying to design programs um, for the populations and to connect with um, the populations that I've uh, mentioned previously. Some good examples um, just off the, uh, in terms of arts access are things like uh, maybe there is um, a program where there's a theater uh, production throughout the year, and then you may have maybe three of those productions just for people who are deaf. Uh, that may be a good example. Another example may be, um, you know, a production of Shakespeare offered to families free in libraries in a particular community uh, that and maybe it has, um, you know, some type of special spin where uh, people in the community participate in that uh, theater production in the library of Shakespeare. There are just many excellent examples of where people have really been creative in how to reach uh, these populations um, throughout Tennessee. Um, I think that's it on arts access, uh, but like Shannon, I'm around and we'll definitely um, answer any questions that you put in the chat box. Um, or as we um, go along with this presentation. Thanks so much. Thank you, Thank Kim. You. Wonderful uh, description of a very important and uh, uh, under her leadership, a, a growing program that, uh, that most of your organizations uh, could take advantage of. So Kim's a great resource to talk about some ideas and things that you're thinking about, mm -hmm. but I uh, really appreciate her giving us an overview of that. Um, the next uh, op few opportunities I'd like to talk about are the ones uh, that are geared for general operating support. Now, these categories I'm going to talk to uh, talk about more briefly, probably than some of the others uh, today. But they are for nonprofit arts organizations. Remember those that have 51% or more of their operations uh, directly uh, arts related. And they also require that the applicant have a funding history with the commission. You need to have at least three years of funding within the past five years in some of our other more project specific categories. After you have that, um, you are eligible to send a uh, request in to your program director uh, to, to formally request entry into one of these programs. Uh, the first couple I'd like to talk about are, are oh, let me go ahead and hit the mute button for everybody. Okay. 
The first one I'd like to talk about is the small rural partnership support and the small urban partnership support categories. These are two of our newer programs. We rolled them out last year. And these uh, categories are were basically to try and help um, organizations that maybe came in for arts project support year after year after year for more or less the same projects. Several of the organizations I fund, for example, maybe uh, say a community theater company and their project would be their 2021-22 season, which in our sort of definition is not necessarily a targeted project, but we understood that uh, the, the funding opportunities that we had in the commission did not exactly address their needs. So we came up with these uh, categories that allowed applicants who traditionally applied in the APS or the RAPS, the uh, Rural Arts Project Support and the Arts Project Support categories, to be able to request the exact same amount of money, essentially to use that money in in more uh, throughout more budget line items. One of the things about Arts Project Support grants is you're limited to uh, only two budget line items for uh, how you wanna spend our funds. This one allows you to use multiple uh, budget line items and it allows you to pay for more sort of general administrative uh, expenses if you'd like uh, to use it for those purposes. Um, another really, uh, a really intriguing and interesting and what was the word I'm looking for here? Appealing, I suppose, uh, aspect of this uh, program is for those organizations that maybe normally come in under APS to switch to this category is that you will only have to go through the panel process every other year rather than every year, uh, like with the APS. So again, it's based on the county in which your organization is incorporated. The small urban partnership support obviously is for the urban counties and the small rural uh, partnership support is for the, uh, the rural counties. Um, Again, we have the eligibility requirements right here, 501c3. This is where I mentioned the three-year history. Uh, we do have a minimum annual budget requirement because the uh, maximum of $9,000, which is what you're allowed to apply for under arts project support, is here verified uh, uh, to be at least 20% of your annual cash operating expenses. So that's the maximum you can apply for is $9,000 in this small urban partnership support. You can check out the, the details for the small rural project support uh, as well um, by navigating to them. But it's a, it's a program, uh, like I say, for many of my long-term APS and uh, applicants that I have encouraged a lot of them to jump into. And uh, I'm happy uh, offline to speak with any of you about in more details about this category because I think it's uh, it's a good one. Um, I'll also uh, briefly mention a couple of other programs. Our partnership support, which is a general operating support for organizations. Um, again, the similar uh, eligibility requirements. This one, though, it, it is required that an organization have at least one uh, full-time staff member and it also requires that you have a complete financial audit every year, which we know is, is uh, sometimes an expensive endeavor. You are uh, allowed to, to request 12% of your total annual cash operating expenses up to a maximum of $40,000. So some of the smaller budgeted organizations that do have a full-time staff member, once you sort of do the math as far as how much it might uh, cost you to do an annual audit, and then what 12% of your uh, cash operating expenses are, you know, that's where you sort of have to use your judgment as to whether or not it's, a, it's it would be, um, it would be a, a effective for you to enter this category to be able to uh, apply for some additional funding beyond what you might be able to with some of our project support categories that aren't tied to a percentage of your income. Anyways, 
I don't want to get too far into the weeds in this category. Again, we're all happy to talk with you all offline or answer any questions during the Q&A about that category as well. And then finally, very briefly, I'll mention our major cultural institutions grant. And this, uh, these are um, organizations that are, are arts producers and uh, they have to have budgets of $1 million a year. So um, they're for the, the largest uh, cultural institutions in the state. Uh, again, um, all of the details you can, you can find here um, as far as eligibility is required and, and we're happy to talk with you all offline about that as, as well. So uh, now that we've talked about several of these uh, opportunities for organizations, I wanted to turn it over to my colleague Krishna, Krishna Adams, who is going to talk about an exciting uh, program we have for individual artists. Krishna, are you there? I am. Thank you, Jared. This is a pretty exciting grant category, and I'm happy to share this. Uh, this is our Individual Artist Fellowship Grant, and it is a very simple online uh, process. It includes uh, some digital uh, images or links to your work and an artist statement and an artist resume and, of course, proof of residency for, the, for Tennessee. So we have some pretty exciting categories for this year. Uh, that is visual art 2D and also uh, mural arts, craft, media and film or photography, dance in choreography or solo dance, music composition, theater playwriting, literary arts in fiction, children's youth literature, or poetry. So this is pretty exciting. Uh, you can see that there's an eligibility criteria, sort of what I talked about a little bit a moment ago. And then also just a reminder that the deadline for this is January 25th which sounds like it's quite a ways off, but it really isn't. Also, excuse me, also the different directors of those categories uh, were all happy to meet, uh, not meet, it's COVID, I'm sorry. Uh, we're happy to talk with you and or email you to look at your application before you submit it, if you'd like. Uh, we're happy to do that, uh, and, and we encourage you to do that. So if you want to uh, finish it before that deadline, that gives us an opportunity to give you some feedback before you submit it. Uh, also, uh, this is a, a wonderful $5,000 granted award. And the good news is when you get it, that's great, but it's a one-time award, so you don't uh, you don't get the chance to apply for it a second time, even if it's in a different category. Uh, but to that, it's really wonderful because this is a grant based on work that you have already completed. And uh, that's pretty exciting because you don't actually have to create uh, something to receive this uh, amount, this, this um, award. So I, I guess maybe I should just see, does anyone have any questions about the Individual Artist Fellowship? Okay, well, if you think of some later on, we are happy to answer those questions. And I guess I will pass this back to Jared. Thank you. Thanks, Krishna. And if anybody who has any questions, obviously, just uh, feel free to use the chat function and we will, we will get to them. You know, we rehearsed this uh, a couple of times, so uh, having to do this in practice is, is going to be interesting, but uh, you know, I have all the faith in the world in our chat moderator, Lee Barrett, who, who uh, we'll hear from in just a little while. So thanks very much. I am going to attempt to toggle, which means I have to lean over to make sure I'm clicking on the right button. And I just wanted to just show you a couple of slides that had some examples of some of the types of grants that we have uh, that we have given in the past. Uh, these are some grants for projects, as you can see, festivals, celebrations around the state. Uh, Blooming Arts, Louis Bluey, our Chinese New Year celebration here in Davidson County, the, the, the 
very uh, internationally renowned festival in Knox, Knoxville, Big Ears, as well as just some organizations that you are probably familiar with around the state that receive our general operating support, like our Children's Theater here in Nashville, the Germantown Performing Arts Center, Knoxville's Museum of Art, and the Dixie uh, in Huntington. So now I want to turn it over to Ann Brown as our Associate Director for Grants and our, as I mentioned, our former long-term uh, Director of Arts Education, who is going to speak to some of our arts education opportunities. So Ann. And you are muted, just FYI. I don't know if I have to unmute you. Let me see if I can unmute you. Well, I, I can't, I'm so sorry. Okay. <laughs> she's on the fly. I'm gonna, I, I, <laughs> she's on the phone. All right, technical difficulties. Hold on. Ann, are you, I, I, I still can't hear you. I'm, hold on, try, try it now. Speak now, Ann. We are professionals, guys. Hello? Oh, yes, thank you. Okay. You know, you think you have a backup plan, and then when that backup uh, plan fails, you go back to the original plan. So thanks, Jared, and sorry about that, everyone. Good morning. Um, so the commission recognizes the value of access and participation in arts education for all Tennesseans. Um, we support a variety of arts learning programs and um, activities in nearly all 95 counties of the state, um, including those for students in pre-K through 12, as well as for lifelong learners. Um, many of our arts education focus on the learning process with an emphasis on increasing skills and knowledge through hands-on participation in an arts form. But um, grantees also accomplish additional outcomes like uh, better student engagement and uh, student um, attendance at school, development of 21st century skills, and improved social and emotional well-being through the arts. So you can find the different arts education grant categories on our website, and we actually have our own arts ed site. It's tnartseducation.org, as Jared has up there. Um, but I'd like to highlight quickly the student ticket subsidy program. So STS provides funds for artist fees, tickets, and transportation for public schools to support arts experiences. Um, so really taking these students um, on an exposure-based field trip, allowing students to see a live performance or visit a museum for the first time. Um, it may be depth experience with a professional teaching artist coming to the school and collaborating with a classroom teacher over a period of time as well. Both types of projects are supported through student ticket subsidy. Really, this program recognizes the value of arts and cultural organizations as well as teaching artists as uh, integral to ensuring that um, students receive a holistic arts education. So if you are interested in offering this work through the STS grant program, um, consider applying for the teaching artist roster. Jared, I don't know if you can um, just show folks that briefly. It's up at the top navigation um, under should be a teaching artist roster under resources there. But um, the, that is a requirement for the STS program. So if you're a teaching artist or you work with an organization offering arts learning opportunities for students, I encourage you to apply here to the roster. Um, and uh, it, it really helps teachers um, see what is available out there in Tennessee for their students. And finally, I will just mention that there are three distinct annual arts education grant opportunities available as well back on our main um, Tennessee arts ed or site as well as right there under the arts ed uh, site. So I encourage you to look at those and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. 
Thank you, Anne. Uh, I have been told that my audio is a little is low. Is it is it low? Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, cool. Well, let me know if I need to shout. Um, it's better now. Oh, good. Thank you, Shannon. So you know we've talked a, a lot about some of our uh, more traditional uh, our artistic uh, you know um, disciplines, and I wanted to highlight one of our. Uh, more unique programs, uh, very traditional in a different sense, but it's our folk life program. And so I wanted to turn it over to our folk life director, Dr. Bradley Hanson. Bradley? Thank you, Jared. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, I'll just say a little bit. We are a, a sort of specialized program within the Tennessee Arts Commission. We work with arts and skills and practices that are traditional in nature. What I mean by that is they are passed down in uh, cultural communities that might be regional or ethnic or or religious or tribal. And so they're shared and passed down in that way, not necessarily learned in school or conservatory or art school. And, um, you know, this could include everything from chair making and broom making, blues and gospel music, uh, fiddle and banjo string band music, all sorts of weaving and, and wood carving and on and on and on. And it's not just old uh, folk life. Uh, we have uh, many new groups, new immigrant groups that bring their folk life to Tennessee. And them, uh, you know, Day of the Dead festivals, some of the Chinese uh, festivals and Japanese festivals that Jared showed, and many more. Now, there's no particular project grant uh, category for folk life, but folk life projects scattered throughout all of those categories. We work with about 50 different organizations that do this kind of folk life preservation work or presentation work. So I'll just make a note of that if you know of a, of a cultural heritage event in your community or an organization that is, is uh, working uh, in preservation, they might want to come take a look at one of our categories and they can reach out to me or Evangeline Me, a traditional arts specialist. We do have a category um, for uh, artists in folk life called the Traditional Arts Apprenticeship Program. And there we fund master artists who uh, practice a rare or endangered or distinctive art form. We, we fund them to pass that on to an apprentice of their choosing for a period of time. And we've done about 40 apprenticeship projects over the past four years. And that's an annual program that we run. And if you have any questions about that, let me know. We have our own website here too. It's tnfolklife.org. There's a lot of documentation on there, of these traditions, because that's a part of what we do. Also, we travel the state trying to document these um, these art forms. And we also have Facebook and Instagram. If you look up uh, Tennessee Folklife Program, you'll find us on those social media platforms. And again, a lot of a lot of um, document documentation illustrating the work that we do. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, Bradley. Um, so. At this point, we are going to, well, I'm going to lean over again and click, make sure I don't click the wrong thing. There we go. Uh, we're going to pause and uh, I'm going to turn it over to Lee, who's been monitoring our chat to see if there are any questions that we should address uh, to the group about grants specifically. Lee? All right. Thanks, Jared. While we're seeing if any new questions come in, I thought I'd address a couple. We did have someone but wanted clarification on which uh, grants require audits, and that's going to be the major cultural institutions and partnership support grants. Are there any others, guys? Yeah, I didn't uh, think so. That's it. The the the, the new programs, this, the uh, small urban and small rural partnership support grants, would just require that you send us a, a, a nine ninety. And also, someone had asked if uh, this uh, slide deck, uh, we can send it to them or make it available. Uh, I think we can do that. Um, it's, I don't think it's copyrighted or anything. So if you uh, email me, uh, I'd be happy to send that to you. Um, however, a lot of what you're seeing on the screen today is from our website that Jared is doing live. So that won't be part of the slide deck. However, this whole thing is being recorded. And we will make that available uh, at, at fairly soon, I should think. If you wanted to watch the whole thing again, I know I will several times. Yes, this is in high definition, 4K Ultra. Uh, but it will be, uh, as Lee mentioned, on our website and uh, probably available on YouTube as well for on demand. So thank you, Lee. 
for that. We're, there's a couple of other uh, portions of the presentation that we'll pause for questions. So if, if you do have them, please uh, keep utilizing the chat to Lee or to everyone and in, in, uh, in we will take those in turn. So we're gonna pivot now uh, that we've talked sort of about our grant opportunities in detail to talk about, well, how would you actually apply for these grants? And so I'm gonna turn it back over to our own website quickly to show you a couple of things. So we've gone down the, the grant opportunities here link and we've tried to organize the website uh, in, in a way that would be the most uh, practical for someone who was unfamiliar with what we do. And so that's why we have, you know, what grant opportunities do we have here? And then how do you apply? So under how to apply, let me just pause for a second and just talk very quickly about the general process of application. I mentioned that your deadline for to complete your application, which I'm gonna show you how to access in just a few minutes is January. Well, after January, we, the program directors receive your application, we review it to make sure it's complete and that you have provided all of the information that is required in the grant. If we need to go back and forth with the applicant to clarify issues or to uh, get documents that may have been uh, overlooked or maybe uh, you supplied the wrong document, things like that, we'll go back and forth with you. And then once all of that's buttoned up, we convene panels to, uh, to uh, rate and review your grant applications. So we convene panels, uh, as usually in person, uh, pandemic notwithstanding, in our offices almost every day during the month of April. These pan so grants are paneled by program. Uh, so for example, I handle performing arts, music, theater, and dance, and I have three separate and distinct panels, one for music, one for theater, and one for dance. Each of those panels has usually six panelists from around the state, experts in the field, who go through each application. They have a score sheet that says from one to 10, how well did the applicant address this particular part of the application? And they will rate, rank your applications uh, in turn at those meetings in April. Again, I wanted to point you back to those guidelines that we just went over, which have the questions that you will be evaluated on in the guidelines so you can familiarize yourselves with what you're going to actually be reviewed on. Um, I also want to say that we're always looking for panelists you probably would make a great panelist if you're tuned into this uh, webinar right now. And if you're interested in being a panelist, before I forget, under our review tab, so grants apply, how to apply, how to review, we do have a little bit more information, in-depth information about these panel review meetings which I'm speaking about now in the panel review process, you can see here is a typical grants panel in our office uh, reviewing uh, applications. And then we also have a nomination form, very simple to fill out about why you think a particular person would make a grants panelist or why you think yourself would make a good grants panelist. You can nominate yourself here as well. So again, we're always looking for panelists Please, if you are at all interested in this opportunity, either contact us or go ahead and fill out this nomination form. And we will put you on the list and we will um, put you to work uh, rating and reviewing these wonderful applications from around the state. So, all right, just gonna hit the mute button there. All right, so now I want to talk about how to apply for a grant, right? So again, I'm gonna go right here under our apply tab. All of our applications are done by via this new online, well, I can't say new, my God, it's been around now for about five years, but our, our online grant system here called Flux. Um, it's a simple tool to use. Um, I'm just gonna point out a few uh, sort of important information uh, points here for you. First of all is anyone using the system needs to have their own login and password. 
used to be that you would have one login and password for each organization and staff members would just share that login and, you know, uh, Bill would work on the application in the morning and then Jane would, would maybe log in a little bit later using the same account to finish it in the afternoon. The new system requires that everybody working in an application have their own unique username and password. And what we can do is link the staff people up to a common organization so that you can share the work. So the first step, if you're not already in our system, is to click this button here for register, where we'll ask you simple information. Are you registering as for an individual for perhaps you're applying for a fellowship? Or are you representing an organization? So we'll ask you some very basic information. And then once you've submitted your request, this is a manual process on our end. So we will get the request. We will hook you up with the organization. The organization may already be in our systems. You may be a new user with the organization. We'll make those connections. And then the system will generate a password for you so that you can go in and start making that, uh, making those um, applications to us. I mentioned this all to you, um, you know, as a warning to not do this the day before a grant is due so that we have time to properly process your registration before, before a deadline. So once you have uh, created a, a login and a password, then you can come into the system. And I have a little fake account here for these sorts of trainings. Hopefully it'll log in. Okay. Okay. So here is the portal that you will uh, see when you first log into the system. There's all sorts of information here on our left-hand menu, information, contacts for all of the program staff. Um, I have a cat bothering me, excuse me. Uh, information, uh, commonly used forms that you're gonna need for some of these in this area we call our document library. But the one I wanna highlight today is this link appropriately named apply for grants. We put it in your face again, who is indeed eligible to reply to apply for most of our grants. We want to give you warning that we want you to be able to use a modern browser. We show you these browsers that work best with the system. Clicking on uh, any of these icons will take you to the website where you can download one of these modern browsers. Uh, you know, it, it has happened in the past where someone is working on a grant application and has uh, it, maybe the browser is not really compatible and um, you can run into some trouble that way. We don't have a ton of, uh, uh, of problems with this, but, you know, we wanted to just for those of you who may be using older machines that might not have been updated in a while to give you resources to be able to modernize. Um, so once you have scrolled past all of this information, then you're going to get to the area where we actually have the grant applications that are open for open uh, for your uh, applying pleasure. Um, we have links here for all of the different grant programs, and these blue links are actually links back to our website to the full. Um, grant guidelines. The link that you're looking for in order to start an application are these green buttons below. So if you have already gone to the website and you say, well, you know, I've spoken with Kim and I know that my project is going to make, is going to fit well within the arts access category. So I want to apply for an arts access annual grant. Well, then you'll just scroll down to the opportunity here and click this button to launch an application. Once you have launched the application, it'll, it'll pull it up. The first step you're going to do is fill out very basic information. The, some of it is obvious which fiscal year you're, you're going to apply for, the name of the category you want. Is this the first time you've applied for funds for the organization? Uh, yes or no? And what type of organization are you? Are you an entity of government, a public school, a nonprofit? Your organization name will already be pre-populated here uh, based on which organizations your registration is connected to. 
And then you're going to, depending on the names of the individuals within your organizations, you're just going to select who the primary contact for this particular grant application is. And then maybe uh, you'll, the primary signatory maybe uh, is the executive director. For example, the contact could be a, pro a project manager. The signatory might be your executive director, maybe uh, your board president, something like that. So we want you to choose who is going to be those individuals. And then the first step in order to actually for the system to produce the appropriate application, because they're all a little bit different once you've entered all this information, is to save your application. So we tell you right here, finish filling out this small bit of information and then save the application. Um, so once we have saved our application and just a quick tip for you all is uh, to save your application often. You know, we don't want you to go down the process of filling out an application for 45 minutes and then accidentally hit, uh, you know, the back button here on your browser and lose all of your information. So whenever maybe you've completed a section, um, go ahead and save it. It just saves it just like it's done now. And then you can open it right back up by clicking this button here in the top right hand corner of the screen, the edit button. So as you see, I've saved my application and now I have a full application here. It's completely blank. So in order to open it and start filling out the application, I'm going to click the edit button here. It's going to open up all those fields and I'll be able to read the questions and, and make the appropriate documentation and appropriate answer the questions appropriately here. Um, you know, some of the questions are uh, narratives. You know, up and we have the number of characters you're allowed to have. For example, the support narrative here, which is basically where you're going to describe your project in detail, allows you for to have 2,900 characters. And as you see, as I type, the number of characters remaining uh, does count down, so you can make sure that you fall within the guidelines and parameters of how much you're allowed to tell us. Um, another tip for this is. You know, it does have some basic uh, edit functions like bold or italics, underline, things like that. Really, though, the uh, best way to do this is probably to write these longer narratives in a program like Microsoft Word or Google Docs or something like that so that you can really go through spell check, edit, and then you can just copy and then, you know, paste them directly into this this support narrative boxes. That usually works well. Sometimes um, it will copy over some of the uh, stylized parts of uh, your narratives from, from a Microsoft Word or a Google Docs. So just go ahead and give that a quick eyeball uh, once you have pasted it in there to make sure that everything looks, uh, nothing looks a little off because Again, these panelists uh, who are looking at this proposal and are, are making their uh, ratings and rankings, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we have, we want to make sure that nothing is 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 off for them, and uh, we don't want their applicants to get dinged for something um, that is not substantive to their actual uh, project or program. So. Um, once you have filled out all of your information, you know, the financial information that we're asking you for, most of our grants require that you show us uh, a three year uh, history of your operating cash revenues and uh, expenses. We want you to explain if, you know, uh, last fiscal year, you, your organization had a $40,000 budget and this year you have a $400,000 budget. Well, what happened? So if you have variances in your budget like that, we might ask you to explain that information. Or if you ran a deficit last year, you know, what happened and, uh, and how did you, what did you do in order to address that deficit and what are you doing moving forward to make sure it doesn't happen again? We want you to tell us your project's budget. In years past, we had said, okay, well, if you're only applying for, let's say, $5,000 to do a particular project, we only wanted you to tell us 
well, where do you want to spend the $5,000 that you're asking us for? Which line item? And where are you going to put your match, that dollar for dollar $5,000 that your organization has to put in for the project as well? Uh, over the last few years, though, we have now uh, asked applicants to provide the entire uh, budget for their project. Um, and also let us know where you want to spend our money in the, in the um within the project, but also just let us know exactly how much you're spending in total so that we can evaluate the project as a whole. We're gonna ask you to, to, to you know, tell us where you're gonna get the income to match uh, the funds you're requesting, as well as what other kinds of income you might expect from the project. And then we're gonna ask you to submit some required documents. We're gonna ask you to show us some proof of arts advocacy. Maybe you have um, a receipt from Tennesseans for the Arts where your organization is a member. That's a proof of arts advocacy that a lot of applicants will, will uh, supply. Or maybe you have written letters to your local town council or mayor or elected officials here in Nashville you know, uh, talking about the importance of the art and thanking them for their support of the arts and, and, and uh, things of that nature. That's another example of what we consider a proof of arts advocacy. Uh, so we want, for that particular, I just mentioned, I don't want to go too in the weeds with every one of these, um, but for that one in particular, it seems to be a bit confusing for people. We want proof uh, rather than uh, a document that just says, we wrote letters to our legislators, or we always uh, give a curtain speech saying by a specially licensed rate. We want something that's actually considered to be proof for that. And then uh, you just can go through and see all of the other documents that are required for each grant category. They do vary between uh, depending on what you're applying for. You'll just click these little plus signs uh, and then just go and grab the files from your computer and upload them. Once you have completed your application for the final time, um, you can click save here. And another tip that I'll offer is whenever you have an application started and saved in any, any state, let's say that you have half of it done or you have a couple of um, narratives completed, then you want feedback. Well, you can contact your program director we have a list of all of our contact informations in this presentation, as well as, of course, on our website. Uh, and we can actually access your application before it's been completely submitted. So you can call us and say, hey, I've, I've, I've completed my application. Can you please just take a look at it and let me know if anything is, is confusing or um, if you can offer any kind of feedback uh, before I finally submit the application. Because once the application is submitted, there's, there's, it's the point of no return. There's no going back unless there's something missing, but you don't have an opportunity to, we don't send your application being back to you and say, hey, your narrative was confusing. Can you rewrite it? That's once you've submitted it, that's, that's all it is. It's basically, if you have an incorrect document or something like that, that's the only thing that you're allowed to change at that point in the process. So um, once you have saved and finally submitted your application, you're going to go into the process that we mentioned, the back and forth, the panel process, and then um, you're going to receive uh, a grant award in usually in early June, which we'll cover in the next portion of the workshop about managing a grant. But uh, that was sort of a very quick overview on how to apply for a grant. I'm sure I've, I've missed some information going through that quickly. So any program director who has any additional feedback, please feel free to jump in here. Otherwise, I'm gonna to toggle back to the presentation and uh, pause for questions. Don't, uh, haven't had uh, any uh, questions come in in the past uh, few minutes, um, but I, I should point out that uh, when I'm responding to private questions that don't really affect everyone, I am sometimes accidentally responding to everyone. You know, I'm learning to use this. So that's, if you see any non sequiturs in the chat, that's what that is. Got it. Okay.
Will this be archived somewhere to be viewed later for with yes. other? <clears throat> yes, ma'am. This 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 uh, entire presentation is being recorded, and uh, as soon as it's it's over, uh, and we're able to uh, to get it sort of in a position to put on our website, it'll be put there. So, probably in the next three or four days. Thank It'll you. be on on the Tennessee Arts Commission website. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, both. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, now I'm going to just uh, go over a little bit about the management of a grant. What happens whenever you do receive a? Um, I'm having to lean again. All right. There we go. Once you have received a grant, then you're going to go into the management section of uh, the grant. Everything you're going to do, uh, you, you, you're going to say, hey, I needed uh, $9,000 to do this particular project. Of course, we don't have enough money to give everybody all of the money they request. Uh, so you're going to get a percentage of that money. And let's say, for example, we say, well, we couldn't give you nine, but we can give you $7,500. We're going to ask you to send us a revised budget based on that new number and a couple of other forms, we're gonna ask you to sign your grant contract. All of that is done electronically and most of that is done in this exact same system. You will receive an email from the system saying, hey, you have a report due. You need to, to show us uh, your revised budget. So once that happens, it'll point you to come back to this online grant system and we will see in this area down here called grants management that you will have a report due and then you'll have a form to fill out. Again, we try to make it uh, user friendly. We try to give you step by step instructions on how to do this. But of course, as always, we are available for you to uh, give us a call anytime. And we're, we're happy to walk you through any part of this process. I'll also mention while I'm in here really quickly that when you have started an application, let's say you started it one day and you want to, to get back to it the next day, all of your applications will be in the applications area. Ones that have not been fully submitted will, will be called our draft applications. You'll see I have one draft application here. That's the arts access application. I'm able to convert it. Once, excuse me, I'm just going to go ahead and mute everybody. And once, uh, once everybody has, uh, you have submitted the application, obviously it will be here under submit an application. Uh, this is a good place to look whenever you are going to apply the following year. You, you know, what did I write last year? We, we, we keep up with all that uh, here in the uh, left hand menu. You'll be able to access old applications so you can see uh, what you put down and uh, use some of the feedback you've maybe received uh, from your program director to make improvements and uh, resubmit the following year so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, one of the uh, important parts about managing a grant that we wanted to just to talk about for just a second is our uh, Title VI training, which I'm gonna turn it back over to Kim to talk a little bit about uh, Kim. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Great. Thanks, Jared. Um, Title VI is a federal requirement. Um, and what it simply means is we're trying to prevent discrimination based on um, race, color, or national origin. Yes, there are other types of discrimination, but Title VI is around those. To meet the requirements very simply each year, every organization must go through annual Title VI training. Uh, the only exceptions to that rule are schools because uh, we work with the Tennessee Department of Education because they have a whole different process on Title VI. But every other organization must go through Title VI training um, on an annual uh, basis. The way that we do this is in flux. Um, it's very simple. It has an online training videos and a common question that I'm asked, uh, who should be trained? Definitely your staff at your organization should be trained, must be trained on Title VI. If you have one staff person pay, 
that's fine. Sometimes you're a volunteer organization, we get that question, then the volunteer or volunteers must be trained. But we must receive that uh, each year. Usually the deadlines for receiving uh, that training form for annual grants is usually the first or second week in December of any given year. And then for like ABC grants is usually in October um, of each uh, of each year. Uh, the other things that are needed um, around Title VI um, are we hope that you utilize some of the resources on the website. There's a Title VI poster on the website, and it should be up in a public, uh, available and, and so that the public can view the Title VI poster. It is definitely on um, uh, the resource page for Title VI on our website. Other things you should have as an organization, you should have an anti-discrimination policy on your website. Uh, as you can see on this screen, here's our non-discrimination policy. You're more than welcome to use this as a model to put on your own uh, website. And last but not least is, uh, I always like to say to people, you know, have a plan for addressing if you ever receive a Title VI complaint. Uh, that's what we try to get to the heart of when you submit um, your um, certification training form each year, but um, it often, uh, even if it's to call me, <laughs> it's absolutely fine if you receive a complaint uh, of any kind around discrimination that we can work with you um, through that uh, whole process. Um, let's see, I think that covers most of the things, but please make sure on an annual basis that you do your Title VI certification training because uh, from the Tennessee Arts Commission, no payments will be dispersed unless we receive your Title VI on an annual basis. And I think that's it. Well, thank you, Kim. Yeah, that's very important. Yeah, you can't get any money until you've completed your Title VI training, which has you know, made those Title VI trainings come in a little bit faster than maybe they've come in years past. Uh, and just a, a, another quick bit of information about getting paid. Uh, most of our grants uh, can request up to 40% of the funds that you have been awarded up front without having to spend any of your own money. Uh, the rest of the grant funds will be on a uh, sort of a dollar for dollar basis where you're going to have to show us that you have spent your match in order to, to receive those funds. So uh, with that, that's the basic information on Ming again on uh, managing your grant. So I uh, wanted to pause again to see if there are any questions about this particular as aspect of the uh, webinar. We Aired. Oh, hello. Um, we had a question. If it's okay to do some, a lot of folks are working remotely. Can Title VI training be done remotely? Um, and I, I suspect that's just fine, isn't it, Kim? I mean, absolutely. The training is designed um, for you. Once you go into the Title VI certification form, you'll see four modules embedded uh, within that form, and so it is definitely done online. The training is. Um, so that you can watch one of the videos, um, your staff, and fill out the rest of the form, and we'll uh, review that form. If it's all complete, then you're approved for, for the year. Thank you very much. Okay, so we are getting close to 1130, which is, we want to try to be mindful of your time, so I do have just a little bit uh, more information. We have obviously not just grants of the Tennessee Arts Commission, but we have many other grants and programs. Please visit our website and you can find out all about this. I'll just mention really quickly, we are doing some webinars during this time and our next webinar, which is, is right there on the homepage of the website for more information, will be on October 21st. Uh, so now I just wanted to turn it over really briefly to Shannon uh, Ford, who is going to talk a little bit about some of these helpful hints and tips uh, for you. Shannon. Hi, everybody. Um, so, yes, we, we do have some helpful uh, tips in terms of um, applying for grants and 
um, it really making the best use of your time. Um, so one, the first thing is consult with us. Um, we are happy to answer questions about our programs. We're happy to review drafts of your applications. Um, we will give you um, feedback and scores after um, the review. And by the way, Gloria Oster, I will be sending that to you later. Um, and also, we we encourage you to make sure that you read the guidelines and um, really um, get some uh, unfamiliar eyes with your program. If you're not asking a program director, ask someone that you know to look at your narrative and proofread it before you send it in. These, this is a competitive grant process and oftentimes, you know, little things like misspellings, grammatical mistakes, don't leave a great impression on reviewers. And so just make sure that you're putting your best foot forward. Um, start early and save often. Um, you don't have to wait until January to start your application. Our applications are open right now. You can start one now. You can get um, it done before the Christmas holidays. So we encourage you to do that. Don't forget to update your organizational information. There's a lot of information that um, your uh, reviewers are going to want to know about the organization, whether it's how you're um, really um, promoting the specialty license plate program or, you know, um, what you're doing in terms of accessibility overall. Um, and you really should get um, your, your demographics into your organizational profile. And finally, um, make sure that your expenses are incurred in the correct fiscal year. Um, if, if you are, you know, really counting on um, being able to uh, pay payroll with your operating support grant um, as soon as the new fiscal year starts, um, make sure that you're paying for work that was actually done in that fiscal year. So oftentimes, if if you're an operating support grantee, you're going to need to wait until, say, July 15th to pay payroll with or reimburse payroll with a Tennessee Arts Commission grant. So that's all I got. But um, of course, uh, we are still open. So if there are any last minute questions, um, please just put them in chat or reach out to Lee. Um, otherwise, um, you can call us at any time. So leave one final time to see if we have any uh, straggling questions to be answered. Jared, I think we've been so incredibly thorough today, or we've so entirely confused people that we have, don't really have any uh, other questions right now. But as others have said, even after this, just give us a call, shoot us an email, we'll answer whatever questions you got. Well, thank you, Lee. Thank you, every program director. Thank you all for coming or for participating in this webinar. This is a new experience for all of us, and uh, we hope that we were able to offer you some good information about our grants. Again, the, the, the best way to, to really get down to the nitty gritty is just to give us a call or shoot us an email. We are available um, for you at any time. Uh, here is a list of all, all of the program directors that have been on this particular webinar. Uh, on our website, we have a contact uh, link for all of us. So, you know, we love talking to you guys. And again, thanks again for, uh, for participating with us and wanted to go ahead and just make a quick uh, plug that we're going to be doing um, essentially a, a, a virtual listening tour where we're going to be doing about a dozen more of these webinars, but we're going to make them community focused, regionally focused. Okay. And we have a list of all of those on our website. We're going to be starting up next week as well. And we're going to be giving a little bit of the same information with this grants workshop, but in, in much, uh, much less detail. But really what this, the purpose of these meetings are is to, for us to have dialogue with communities specifically about how the pandemic has been affecting the artists and the organizations in your community and uh, talking about some resources that, that the uh, Arts Commission has and uh, really just sort of 
um, you know, since we can't be with you physically uh, for us to, to really uh, be able to talk one on one with you. So uh, please take a look at our website for that. There's more information um, and we look forward to seeing you maybe again during one of those. So thanks again and uh, cheers to you all. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you.